So we just looked at a union right here. And a good way to think about union is very much like addition. So we're going to look at difference, which is where we take one set and then remove another set from it. So that'll be subtraction, or very similar to subtraction. So if I just write a minus b in set notation, that's all a and a such that a is not in b. So you're taking everything in A and then pulling out what's in B. So if we look at a Venn diagram, A, B, A minus B, I'll shade in in blue. That's A minus B right there. So in a Venn diagram, it's everything in A that's also not in B. <clears throat> So one way to write the interior is everything in S minus the boundary. And a way to write the boundary of S is everything in S minus the interior. So what if you get a set S and S is equal to its interior. What claim can we make about the boundary in this case? So, so if S is equal to its interior, that means there is no element that's not an interior point. So there's a couple ways to write this. One of the uh, ways to describe it's an open set. So there's no boundary. So it's an open set, meaning there are no points on the boundary. So how do you write ds equals nothing? If I just write ds equals 0, that's not really nothing. So we have a special symbol called the empty set. Another way to write the empty set in set notation is sort of silly, but you just put two brackets with nothing in the middle. So here's my container, and there's nothing inside. So there's two ways to write the empty set. So what type of open sets have you seen? You have seen open intervals. So let's look at the real number line. And let's take an easy, we'll go 0 to 1 right here. So I want to look at the open interval from 0 to 1. And I'll use regular notation here. So we have two empty circles filled in in between. So that would be an example of an open set. All right, why is this an open set? Let's think about every point inside this set right here. So I'll take any point. Can you see that blue on there? Yeah, it shows up pretty well. All right, how can I make a neighborhood or a circle or a disk around this point? What is a disk going to look like in one dimension? I could draw one but most of the parts I drew are not actually inside the real line. So an open set in one dimension, an open neighborhood actually just, whoa, just looks like an open interval around that point where you go the same amount one direction as the other. So any point I take between zero and one there is some minimum distance away from 0 and 1, and I can just take half that distance. And then that's my open set uh, radius right there. I could have a point really close to one of the endpoints, but I can still just take half of the distance to the end of the interval right there. So that's what an open set looks like in one dimension. It's an open interval. You can also have the union of open intervals.
So that is an open set. So we'll look at closure. So the closure of a set is denoted S with a bar on top. And S bar is equal to, well, it's going to be S union S union limit points of S. All right, so what in the world is a limit point? Limit point is any point, doesn't need to be an S, such that, going somewhere up here, it's going to look just like battery point. The only difference is we don't require it to come from the set S. So the idea is it's going to be any point such that any disk around it, oh, actually I have a little more, a little more, to the definition. On your example, uh, does it do it any kind of point with the limit as it x approaches 1 on that real number? Uh, we'll go back to that one in a second. Uh, so limit point is any x such that any disk with a radius centered at x intersects s So one way to describe the disk intersects S is to say the disk intersect S is not empty. So there is something in the intersection. So that means there's at least one point in D epsilon x intersect s. There could be lots more than one point, but there isn't no points. So there's at least some points in there. So let's look at that same example we just looked at, where we have 0 and 1. All right, there are some limit points. Why is 2 not a limit point? Because it doesn't have a point. So if 2 is a limit point, any disk I draw around 2 intersects the set S. So here's the set S. I'm going to draw one disk around 2 that doesn't intersect S. So I can just take the radius to be a half or a third and then here is one disk around 2 that does not intersect S. So that's why 2 is not a limit point of this set. So 2 is not in S bar. That's how we can write that mathematically. So 2 is not an element of S bar. All right, let's look at 1. 1 is not in S. That's fine. But if we look at the point 1, No matter how big of a radius I use for my disk, some part of it is going to intersect on the left side. Every single disk I draw, you can't have a radius zero disk, but every disk with a positive radius is going to have some points in common with S right there. So that's why 1 is a limit point of S. So we can write 1 is an element of S bar. And likewise, 0, I can draw any disk around 0. And I will get some intersection right here on the right half of that disk. So 1 is an element of S bar.
And so the closure of S is S and all the limit points of S. So if we use that notation, so 0, 1 bar equals 0, 1 union 0 and 1. So here I have the open set 0, 1 and include 0 and 1. There's a much easier way to write this. Square bracket 0, 1. Instead of open plus the endpoints, you can write it as square bracket 0, 1. So that's s bar equals s union. Limit points of s. So let's look at two different sets. So we'll let S1 equals 0, 1, and S2 will be 0, 2. And let's leave it close to 0, open at 2. All right, so find these. I want to know the boundary, the interior, and the closure. For S1 and S2. We did a lot of this for S1 already. So we already computed the closure of S1 is the closed interval 0, 1. So we did that already. So find the closure of S2 and the interior of S1, interior of S2, and the boundaries. So S2 closure, are there limit points in S2 that are not already in S2? Are there limit points of S2 that are not already inside of S2? Two. So 2 is a limit point. So the closure is 0, 2 closed on both sides because you're just adding in the 2. So that's what the closure is. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to go for the boundary. Is there a boundary for S1? Are there any points? Let's go back to the boundary definition. So we're a boundary point of any disk. So if there's any disk such that the disk is not entirely contained inside S. So we'll look at 0, 1. Is there any point in 0, 1 All right, for a boundary point, why is zero not considered a boundary point? What's the first part of being a boundary point? It has to be inside S. So zero is not a point inside S, so zero can't be a boundary point. One cannot be a boundary point because one's not inside of S. So right away, it looks like there's no boundary points. Let's see if there's a boundary point inside all right, so I picked a point in S, so so far so good. Now the boundary, 
So battery point, any disc containing this point also contains at least one point not in S. So I'm going to draw any disc. Here's one disc. Does this disc I just drew contain any points that are not in S? Nope. So that definition said any disc I draw has to have some points not inside S. This disc, here's a disc that has all its points inside S. So that means an interior point can't be a boundary point. And that's all we have to check. Just look any point inside. You can form a small disc inside the set. So that means the boundary is nothing or empty. So that was DS1 is empty. What about boundary of S2? Is there a boundary point in S2? Well, let's look at zero. So two won't work because two's not inside the set. So that's already out. Let's look at zero. Now I can't draw every disc, but I can draw a disc right here. So this is one disc. Every point to the left of zero is not inside S. Any disc I draw is going to go a little bit to the left of zero. And so that right there is not in S2. Any disc I draw is going to have some part of it not inside S2. So the boundary is just zero. So it's bad form to just write boundary equals zero. You should write it in set notation. So it's the number zero, and that's it inside that set. Now we're going to look at the interior. So S1 interior, there were no boundary points, and a set can always be decompose into interior and boundary. So we already said there's no boundary, so it's all interior. So S1 interior is just S1, which is the open interval 0, 1. So now we're going to go for the interior of S2. What is the interior of S2? So 0, 2, but open on both sides. So we're throwing away the single boundary point we got. So we'll go for a few more definitions now. So S is an open set if there's two uh, ways to look at it. If boundary of S is nothing, so that's one way to describe an open set, or an equivalent way, so I'm comparing equations, an equivalent way is S interior equals S. So if S is only interior points. So that's what it takes to be an open set. You've seen open intervals. This is the generalized version of open intervals. So this is a closed set if, so let's think about closed sets. <clears throat> they are going to have a boundary, uh, but we have to get a little bit more creative in thinking about closed sets. So if, let's see the best way to describe this, we need to talk about limit points. So if all limit points are, are already in S, or all limit points are contained in S. And an equivalent way to write that is S closure equals S. So if I closed S, if I put all the limit points in there, I would just have the original set S. 
I wouldn't get any additional points that weren't in there already. So the best versions are those right there. So the next thing we'll talk about is a level set. So level set of a function from Rn into R. So it's the inverse image of a value in the range. And if we write that out in set notation, you could take any C in the range of F. All right, did I assume my function is one to one? Yes. No, maybe one to one, maybe not. So what I'm writing here, when I write F inverse, I'm not claiming that F inverse is a function. If F inverse was a function, I would get a single value here. If F is not one to one, and I look at the inverse image, I won't necessarily get a single point here. I could get lots of points. So the inverse image is going to be all x in the domain of f such that f of x equals c. So it's all inputs such that the output is c. So that's a level set. Uh, if you're in, if n is two, if n is two, this would be called a. What is this called? A level curve. I think it's level curve when our n is two. And we have one more definition, which is a surface. So surface will be the graph of a function going from R2 into R. And we write down the graph. We wrote this before, but it's x comma y comma f of x, y, such that x, y is in the domain of f. So that's a surface. So we're going to graph level sets of this function. So f of x, y equals 100 minus x squared minus y squared. So before we start graphing level sets, we're going to need to pick some c values. So let's write down what the range is. What is the largest value you can get out of f? Can I get 100 out of this function? 
How do I get 100 out? Zero, if x is 0, y is 0, I get 100 out. Now, I like the version on the right side a little bit better. Let's look at this. When x gets bigger, if y stays 0 and x gets bigger, what happens to the output? It's going to be decreasing. So 100 is the biggest value we're going to get out, and we can definitely get smaller values out. Is there a smallest value? No. Nope, I can make x huge and get a huge negative value. Or make y a huge number and get a huge negative value that way. So there's no lower bound, but 100 is the largest. So we go from negative infinity to 100. So certainly 100 is a good C value. So we'll go 100. Let's do, what's another good number? Ninety-nine. I think the next best one will be ninety-six. Then ninety-one. Let's get crazy and do zero. All right. So we're going to start with a hundred right here. C is a hundred. F inverse of one hundred is equal to. I'm using the definition at the top of the board right there. So the inverse image of 100 is, in this case, x, y in the domain of f, such that f of x, y equals 100. All right, our function f, is there anything not in the domain? Are we dividing? No. Square roots or even roots? Nope. So every x, y is in the domain. So there's nothing missing in the domain. So that makes this a little bit easier. f of x, y equals 100. f of x, y is 100 minus x squared plus y squared. Do a tiny bit of algebra. We will subtract the 100 to the other side. So we get x squared plus y squared equals 0. And we said the domain is everything. So it's all points x, y, and r2 such that x squared plus y squared equals 0. So that's the inverse image of 100. What does that look like? We said there was a way to hit 100. 0, 0. So if x is 0, y is 0, that's the only point in this set right here. So that's the point 0, 0. That's f inverse of 100. So let's do f inverse of 99 now. So x, y is in R2 such that 100 minus x squared plus y squared equals 99. So if I subtract 99 and add x squared plus y squared, I have x squared plus y squared equals 1. You've seen this before. You know what the graph is. Unit circle. Center at the origin. So this will be unit circle. All right, find F inverse of ninety six. 
It's not going to be the unit circle. How can we describe the inverse image of 96? Circles, four. So it'll be a circle centered at the origin with what radius? So it'll be a square root of 4. So you're looking at the square of the radius. All right, so circle centered at zero, zero, radius is two. All right, so that's enough to draw a couple level sets, so let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> so there's our C equals, oh, C equals 100 level set. So there's my C equals 99 level set. That'll be radius 1. Now radius 2. That's C equals 96. So another way to think about it, 100 minus the C value is the radius squared. So what would my radius 3 circle, what C value would that have? Oh, C value? Yeah, our C value. So I want our radius to be 3, so the radius squared will be 9. 91. So that will be a 91. And if C equals 0, what would the radius of my circle be? Our C is 0, our radius will be 100, or, or our radius squared will be 100, so our radius will be 10. So what we just drew is a topographic map, but the only uh, difference between the one you're used to looking at is normally the spacing right here determines how much you went up. With the way we drew this, with level sets, you actually have to look at the difference in the C values to know how high you are climbing with each ring. So I'm not climbing one foot with each ring. In this case, that would be three feet. I'll use a different color. Go with blue or green. So that would be three feet. This would be five feet. That would be one foot right there. So they are evenly spaced, but they don't represent climbing up one foot. Or if you're used to looking at topographic maps, they usually go by 100 feet or 200 feet, depending on the scale you're using. So they're a little bit different. So is the graph of this going to be a hill, some type of circular hill, or a circular valley? What are we looking at? Here, C is the altitude or the Z value. So are we looking at a hill or a valley? Hill. We're looking at a hill, because the center is 100 height, and then the height is decreasing as we walk away from the center. It's a very steep, it starts out not being steep, and it gets very steep very quickly. So I believe this would be a parabolic hill. If you drew it, it would be a sad parabola, and you'd want to draw some type of circularness to it. So that's what the hill would look like if you drew it in more three-dimensionally. It's a cartoon hill. It's a parabolic hill. 
All right, so that is level sets right there. So we'll do one more example. So this function is the square, it's three dimensional input. And we're gonna just take the square root of the squares of the values. You could write that in vector form as the vector x, y, z, but taking the magnitude. So let's look at the range of f. What is the smallest value we can get out of f? Zero. zero. And we can't get zero out if we put in zero, zero, zero. So we can definitely get zero out of here. What's the biggest value? Infinity. Infinity. So you can go all the way to as big as you want. I don't know why I was writing 100. Zero to infinity. All right, so we'll take level sets, start at zero. Because we're square rooting, I'm going to take C values that are squares. So we'll go zero squared, one squared, two squared. That'll probably be good enough. You cannot graph these level sets very easily because you're going to have three dimensional objects. So I want you to think about and describe the three level sets you get for zero, one, and four. They're, three dim they're living in three dimensional space. So do your best and describe what these are. I'll write f inverse of 0 is x, y, z, such that. The way this function is written, yes, we are square rooting, but there's no way to get negative values out of the x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So the domain is all points in R3. So f inverse of 0. such that the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals zero. You can write this in vector form, and I'll do that right now. V in R3, such that magnitude V equals zero. So that's the exact same thing written as vectors. What type of vectors are we describing here? The zero vector in three dimensions. So we can write that as the zero vector so I did the zero vector, just went around zero a couple times. So that's the zero vector in three dimensions. All right, F inverse of one. Let's keep it in vector notation. How can we describe F inverse of one? So we got one, we can use the word unit. So we could say it's all unit vectors in three dimensions. What does that look like? Sphere. It's a sphere with what radius? One. one. So we can write it as all unit vectors in R3. So that'd be a one way to describe it with words, or you could write the unit sphere. All right, describe f inverse of four now. So what is, what type of vectors will have an f value of four? So that'll be all sphere, all vectors with radius with magnitude four, which will be a sphere of radius four. So the sphere centered at zero, zero, zero. 
radius of four. Now, when I just wrote unit sphere, I was being lazy. I meant unit sphere centered at the origin. So that is the end of 14.1. So we'll start calculus tomorrow. Thank you.